okay. I think he is. I think his head went into uh, the, the the linesman's uh, chest. I don't okay. think the knee ever got to him. Hi, Vicky. Hi, guys. How are you? Good. Good. So, um, how think, many how many people are you asking questions for today? Just one. Okay. Just one. And actually, I think last night's game answers Philip's question. Oh, okay. okay. So it is: Do you see Minnesota's strength on home ice? decreasing significantly when there's no longer Miko to match up against the top lines. Well, I mean, mostly Erickson X line is the line that's going up against top lines, especially at home. Um, but if you look at that first goal by Anaheim yesterday, um, that, was, that was, I mean, it was a bad goal, obviously, that Kakanen gave up. But that all did start with uh, just a really bad shift by that line. So, um, but, it, but it just makes, anytime you lose now Miko and Eric Stahl potentially, um, just makes life uh, way too difficult on everybody else. I mean, you know, now suddenly you have Donato playing big minutes at a position that really is not his natural position in the NHL. You have Rask playing elevated minutes when I don't care how well he's playing, he's not a top six forward. Um, and um, and then you're moving Hartman to the middle, and and uh, so it's, it, it is tough. But you know, Miko, it just it just hurts your depth overall. And, and the bigger one to me is still Spurgeon. I mean, you know, he, it's a huge loss. And hopefully he can come back before Christmas. But I, I will say I, I shot the breeze with him a, three or four times yesterday. And he, he's not saying that he can't, but it doesn't sound like, uh, it doesn't sound like um, this is something that uh, he trusts. Is, you know, right now he's still wearing the splint, let's put it that way. Um, so it doesn't sound like he thinks that he's going to be able to come back here in the next week or so, and it's been almost a week since they said he'd be out a couple. So It was delightful to see Brian Rolston up on the screen last night. Yeah, it's a shame he couldn't come. Yeah, he's still one of yeah. my favorite people. When you talk people. to him next time, tell him we would yeah. love to see him. No, he's, he's absolutely uh, one of my favorites that I ever covered, and it would have been nice. If, I know he wanted to come here really badly, and he was, he was booked. Yeah. You know, he's, he had a hotel and a flight and everything, and then unfortunately just had to, had to cancel. You know, I know Gabrick hasn't played the last couple of years, but it looks like when you Google him that he's still under contract. Well, yeah, because he's willing, he would like his money before he goes he, off in the sunset. He'll never play another game for them. No. He's one, he's one of those where he's hurt, but he's living in trench and doing his own thing. I mean, he's just oh. making sure he's just, you know, it's not, not his fault. I mean, he, no. he's owed this money. He has two years left on his contract, but he's not in Ottawa rehabbing. You know, okay. he's in trench and. Well, it's so um, him. And same thing, Brodsey has got a year left on his deal, and he's, he's done. He's never playing again, and oh. it is painful watching him right now walk. Oh. I mean, it, I got to think he, he looks like he's, uh, he's got a degenerative back thing. Um, a little sciatic issue going on right now, and just you could see it when he's walking. It's it's uh, it's tough because this is somebody that went into training camp uh, expecting to play and failed his physical. Yeah. Well, I thought the uh, Miko tribute was wonderful. I really did. Yeah. And it was fun. We were watching them over in their suite, mm-hmm. and I noticed that once the game started. Miko would, did not take his eyes off the ice. He yeah. was yeah he yeah. No, I noticed it was that so too. Like him. Um, yeah. That's why I, last night on Twitter I was a little kind of hit and miss because I was down there a good amount trying to do uh, that. And then I was running around because I wanted to get Brendan Manel's uh, family before the game. But uh, but you're right. I mean, it, it's interesting. Like like you know, um, Miko, Jared. I mean, even upstairs, Patteron, um, Sealer. They're just fixated on the ice, which just shows you that they still are, are teammates even when they're hurt. Yeah, it really was. Or in Sealer's case, scratch. Cool. Yeah. All righty. Thank you, Vicky. Appreciate Alrighty. it. And thanks, Philip. Uh, on Twitter from Zach Spicer, does Bruce's consulting option actually amount to anything if he's not retained after the season? I'm curious if it ever meant anything in the first place. It's clear he still wants to coach even if it is in Minnesota. Yeah, I mean, but he's got to – I mean, the good news is that – I mean, I don't know if we've mentioned yet that Pete DeBoer was fired since we started this podcast. Oh, yeah, we and, haven't, actually. And uh, the San Jose cl- coach. So all of a sudden there is a ton of coaching jobs available that if, if Bruce isn't retained here at the end of the year, he's going to have uh, options. Um, so what it is, is it's an insurance policy for him. He knows he's getting a little money here in the next couple of years. He wants to coach. If he can't get a coaching job, I'm sure Billy Guerin would love to have him at his disposal um, in some capacity. But a lot of times, it's a new thing now with coaches the last five, six years where they're given these extra little sort of, you know, almost severance packages here. Um, so at a minimum, I mean, I could tell you I would agree with, uh, with, with Jeff it was uh, Zach. Spencer. Zach, sorry. Um, 
I, I would agree with the fact that Bruce wants to coach, um, and so the only way it would amount to something is if he's not hired elsewhere. From Benjamin Richardson, what should the Wilds plan to find a top-line center for the future be? Stahl and Koivu are in the twilight, and Cunner and Eck look more yeah. like good depth centers. To yeah, his, I mean, opinion. you know, it would be easy to say the way to do it is to develop it, but that would absolutely take time. So it is an issue. Uh, it's been an issue for as long as I've covered this team that they haven't had a true number one center, and and so uh, we'll see. Um, we'll see what they do. I mean, it, it, the problem the problem that you have with situations like this is that the easiest thing is to go out here and and acquire one. But that's where the Wild always get into their same old cycle, broken record type things of just overpaying thirty somethings or twenty eight year olds. That, you know, it's it's kind of why you know, like I, I sat down with Billy Guerin just shoot the breeze with him for an hour and in Raleigh the other day on the day off because we were both pretty much bored. And um, and we were talking about a lot of things, but the one thing I, I kind of got during that is that even somebody like Taylor Hall, that he, I'm sure, loves the guy, but he, you know, all of a sudden you acquire Taylor Hall at 28, and now you're giving a seven-year, eight-year deal to another 29-year-old at that point. And next thing you know, if you don't win the cup in the next two, three years, you're seeing his twilight. So... The, the way to do it is to is to acquire young twenty somethings or, or pick some prospects and develop it. But again, uh, that doesn't stop the short term issue that the Wild are going to lack a top six center here in the next couple of years or two of them. A few minutes left yeah. in the show. Uh, Zeke Boyett and Lonnie both asked questions about Parisi. I think we've covered that enough. We'll have a live question from Father here. Who's going to take Michael's confession? Father, it's going to be fascinating. <laughs> Uh, let me just say, th- yeah. let's say my thank yous one more time to Tin Shed. It's Tin Shed uh, Tavern in Savage. Check it out. Uh, Twill in the Dining Gallery. I highly recommend going by. The uh, friendliest staff you're going to find. Very relaxed place. Just take a walk through and see what you can find. It's great, great place to buy presents for the bald man in your life or, or any male in your life. Uh, thank you to, to Gray Duck Vodka for jumping on board. Uh, Minnesota's Vodka. Please check that out if you are a vodka drinker, even if you're not. Uh, Fixology Repair, fixologyrepair.com, and Tony Hoagland, your State Farm agent, Champlin. And thanks to everybody who came out again tonight. Yes, sir, Father. So with uh, one of the local reporters indicating the favorability of the uh, Winter Classic coming here, I don't remember who was talking about that, but uh, with the there was talk a lot about wanting to make this particular Winter Classic have a lot more activities and events that would mm-hmm. be surrounding it due to the size of Target Field. What would be some of those types of events? Uh, I know for myself, I was thinking, of course, high school hockey is very popular, yeah. but I don't know that that would draw in. Yeah, what- usually stuff like that happens after the event. Um, so, uh, I mean, concerts. They want to put some concerts at XL Energy Center. We're part of that revenue. We'll go to the league and the team. Um, stuff like that. Uh, Trampled so, by turtles. Um, that'd be uh, a favorite of mine. Um, you know, the, and, and others as well. I mean, and then other things around, you know, alumni games, festivals. Um, they're just looking for other revenue streams uh, to, to just, um, you know, make it, make it a, a big event. So, um, you know, as I've been writing for, honestly, so long now um, the, and, and wrote the other day is, is that this thing, unless it just implodes here in the next three weeks, is going to happen. Um, you know, uh, I think that fans should be excited about it. Um, it's it's going to be a really cool thing. Um, the league is trying to figure out who the opponent should be. NBC is trying to figure out who the opponent should be if it happens. Um, and so, uh, you know, the favorites there would be St. Louis, um, Colorado. I think the Wild and even the league might really be interested in Winnipeg. The question is, is NBC interested in that? Dallas would have made a ton of sense, but they're hosting it this year. And, you know, if you look at the history of Winter Classics, no, no team has been in it in two Winter Classics in a row. Um, Chicago is another one that has a potential. But, uh, I, you know, I will say the Blues almost seem cemented at this point. But, you know, maybe, maybe the fact that, that I wrote that story the other day and, and, the t- and tweets and things like that, that maybe the NBC executives and the NHL will be like, wait a minute, not one person is saying I want them to play the Blues. I mean, it seems like everybody is saying Winnipeg, Colorado, Dallas. So, so maybe that will change it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Father. It will be fun. I mean, Appreciate the it. league, the, the team, you know, Craig Leopold, Matt Maka, has been working on this for years, and uh, I think it's cool that the city of Minneapolis also and the Wild um, and the Twins um, had the league come in for the Final Four in the Super Bowl to really um, show, the, show the NHL that 
what Minneapolis could do for a huge event and things like that. And then the other thing is, you know, to get back to the point of, of other events that could happen is that the team is based in St. Paul. So they want things in St. Paul to have it be a true Twin Cities Winter Classic. And, and so that even though the game would be played in Minneapolis, that, that they could have things at, at the X that week. So it'd be kind of, kind of neat. Yeah, uh, from Jared Mealy, which former players... As long as Jim has to cover the game outside, uh, that'd be kind of fun. I'll, I'll send an assistant. Uh, yeah. Which former players were slated to make the celebration last night but didn't? You mentioned Ballard. Ra- Ralston Vanek. was the only one. Ralston was the only one? Okay. Yeah. And uh, from Elliot, who do you think gets moved to make room for Kaprizov and Kovanov? I mean, it, it wouldn't be funny if after a year of Paul Fenton trying to trade Jason Zucker that he's the guy. I mean, it really could be that guy. Um, you know, and then you move Fiala to the left side. It, it really is amazing what's happened here the last uh, couple of months, which is also why you don't want to get ahead of yourself and say all oh, is fixed because there's still four points out of a playoff spot. But a month ago, Billy Guerin could have traded so many players off this team and was really tempted to do so. Um, you know, Yul Eriksson he had a lot of interest in. Fiala he had a lot of interest in. Donato is somebody that he's talked to other teams about. Um, probably Zucker and Brodeen. But he resisted doing it then, and so far the team has repaid him by, by getting points in 12 of the last 13 games, but yet they're still outside the playoff picture right now, um, even though they have a couple games in hand on the teams ahead of them, although Nashville, I think, is a couple games in hand on them. Um, of course, uh, Mary knew that to be true. She is now a Predators fan. Um, so... Uh, <coughs> I follow you on Inst- on Instagram. You uh, you have some Predators jerseys. Um, so she has one <laughs> Predators jersey. Um, my favorite. I don't. So Mar- Mary has an Instagram video when she was in in Nashville getting autographs on the yellow carpet, and and Granlin was about to walk right by her, and she she's taking pictures of Granlin signing for everybody. Is that why Granlin's hurt? Did and, you tackle him? And then as Granlin was going by. Boom, you stopped him. It was pretty funny. <laughs> Granny! So, Always lead with the shoulder. Yeah. Hit him right in the chest. Um, but so, you know, frankly, in a, a bad month, which conceivably could happen with these injuries, could put them back in the state where anybody could be traded again. So, um, you know, uh, I thought Fiala um, has struggled here the last three games, um, hasn't been very good. Um, so hopefully he doesn't take a ch- further turn for the worse. But then you have guys like Zuccarello that are playing much, much better right now. Tonato's playing really well right now. Brodine and Susi continue to be really, really good. Um, so we'll see uh, how they continue to do here. Yes, sir. How are you guys doing? Good. How, how are you? you? Good. So uh, my question is, uh, with the coaching changes that we've seen in the NHL the last month with Babcock and uh, what happened with Crawford and... Yes. Um, Picking on players or kicking them and stuff. You've been in the league a lot. Have you have you seen this? Because you don't see it in the other. So far, we haven't seen it in the NBA, NFL, yeah. Major League Baseball. All of a sudden, we're seeing it in hockey that coaches have been abusive and stuff. And I remember when I was a, in, growing up in college and high school. I mean, yeah, the coach got on us, and mm-hmm. I don't see anything wrong with that. What, do right, you, what right. have you seen? Or, well, I mean, I will say I've never witnessed any abuse from any coach in front of me. Ever. Um, I could tell you I've never seen it. Um, and I covered Keenan. <laughs> um, you know, the only abuse I've ever seen is when my podcast partner will, like, knock me again in the head. And I think that's really just really un- I think it's un- unacceptable. Um, any lawyers in the house? Just quick. Qu- no. It's hope- um, I hope not. God, I hope not. But, uh, you know, and in terms of abuse, the only abuse I've ever seen on the ice has been player versus player. Uh, it was, you know, fights on the ice. I once watched a player kick another player in the face, and that was his last day, maybe in the NHL, definitely with the Florida Panthers. Todd Gill, in practice, uh, kicked Max Beerbrier. I cannot believe I remember that kid's name. Never played a game in the NHL. Um, kicked him in the face uh, while he was stretching in practice. And uh, I, I uh, oh, my God, did I lose my mind. I destroyed Todd Gill, a decorated veteran who's in camp on a... PTO. I mean, I destroyed him like I've never destroyed a player. I couldn't believe I was. I witnessed it. He kicked him in, with the boot in the face, Oof. and um, and he was. That was it. Rick Dudley, I think, was GM at the time. Got rid of him. Rick Dudley or Brian Murray, but I think it was. I can't remember. Um, and so um, but I've never seen 
coaches do it. So I, it's a day of reckoning. There's no doubt. I mean, there these coaches are. I know there's certainly a lot of coaches right now that are probably thinking, "Oh my God, what did I do in the last 20 years? And is it going to come out by a 